Well, let's talk about uh, ocular tumors today, and there's some overlap with what we talked about yesterday, but some of the principles uh, apply. So, uh, role of lithography with uh, eye tumors. Again, opaque media, if you can't see inside the eye, there's a certain percent of people that will have hidden tumors you need to know about. Uh, differentiation of visible lesions. Uh, measurements for growth. Now, this is really important. We do this a lot now. Uh, when I trained, it was like, you know, I came in with a possible tumor and you took the eye out the next day, so you didn't have to measure for growth because you didn't have an eye. But now, a lot of these we follow um, just to see if they're growing or not. Uh, post radiation therapy, how they look after radiation, if they're changing, and the detection of posterior extension. So, these are kind of the, the roles for ultrasound with eye tumors. So opaque meeting we talked about uh, yesterday. Anything that blocks your view of the fundus, I think is an indication for ultrasound, especially in a patient you don't have a history of. If you followed them over years and watch your cataract slowly grow, that's probably not so critical, but somebody new they haven't seen before, um, especially with anything unusual, inflammation or pain or kind of a vague history, that's always a reason to do ultrasound. In the old uh, Zimmerman's pathology series years ago, about 10% of these patients will have uh, Harper and suspected melanomas with blind, painful eyes. So I think that still holds up. Uh, important too, the evisceration, which is a, a common way to treat uh, blind, painful eyes because it's cosmetically better to leave the sclera intact, uh, yet they can harbor unsuspected tumors. And you miss those if you just do regular contact posterior segment B scan. You have to do an immersion technique, look at the anterior uh, segment because 0.62% uh, of these patients in the series had uh, tumors in the anterior segment that hadn't been picked up on a posterior segment evaluation. So you always got to do that as part of your uh, uh, look at the eye, the whole eye. Differentiation of lesions. Um, you know, I think we're pretty good. We look at lesions, and, but it's surprising how even the experts could miss lesions and uh, misdiagnose them. So in this case here, this actually was a melanoma here, a melanotic melanoma, which a certain percent can be. This is a metastatic breast uh, to the choroid. Uh, this was a nevus here, melanoma here. And this is a chordal hemangioma. Uh, right here is the hemangioma, but here's a melanoma, a melanotic. So again, just to look at these, you really, you know, you'd be wrong at least a fifth of the time. That was the, I mentioned AFIP series twice, two decades apart, and both of those times they were 20% wrong. It's amazingly consistent. These are things that were misdiagnosed as melanomas, and we knew this because these are eyes that were taken out. Again, in those days, nucleation was pretty much uh, standard of care, so these eyes were actually in the path lab, so we knew what they actually were. And suspicious nevi were number one, uh, just more than a fourth. The central discoform lesions, peripheral discoform, RP hypertrophy, hemangiomas, reactive RP hyperplasia, melanocytomas, oral detachment, hemorrhagic retinal detachment, vitreous hemorrhage, detached retinal pulsar scleritis, or all other things that were misdiagnosed as melanomas. So those were things that were, uh, eyes were taken out for. Measurements for growth. It's a patient that I saw several years ago. They came in with kind of a small tumor and it met the criteria for melanoma by ultrasound, the A scan uh, from here to here. It was low reflective, regular, has some vascularity, so very treatable. Uh, you could have either plaqued it or just kind of watched it. He kind of gave the option to him. He elected to, to not treat it. He came back, unfortunately, two years later instead of three months later, which we advised him. And the tumor had grown quite a bit, starting to kind of mushroom here and a lot bigger by A scan. So definitely need to be treated. And we recommended radiation plaque. And again, he well, he had some kind of nature therapy, and you know, he was seeing a naturopath a guy and he said I'm going to do that instead so he came back six months later and it was this big so just really growing so now you're past the point of plaquing these things the guys here in town uh, Kirk Woodward uh, others that do these say that eight millimeters is kind of their limit for plaquing once you're past that you're ready to the morbidity to the eye is probably not worth putting the plaque on so he was really to the point where nucleation was uh, recommended he still refused it he was going to get better by taking natural therapy. And then he finally came back six months later with a lot of pain in his eye, he had a you know, rubiotic eye, pressure was 60, 
he thought it was a sinus and they were hurting, he wanted sinus medicine. I said, no, it's, you know, it's a tumor. It's filled, it's filled your eye. And he still wouldn't do anything, so he was in the obituary six months later. So that's a natural course of this if you don't treat it. So just as a study in that, a patient refused treatment and we watched over about a four year period, this tumor grow from very treatable to, uh, to a, a, a killing. So that's the story. Post radiation therapy, uh, if you treat these, so here again is a melanoma. Uh, the B scan shows the lesion here, and the A scan here. So here's the tumor, here's the sclera. Inside the lesion, it's low reflective, regular. Those are criteria that we go by for diagnosing. And this is after radiation. So what happens, they get smaller, of course, that's, that's your hope, but also reflectivity changes internally as they necrose, as they become blood vessels atrophy, different things happen. Instead of being low reflective and regular, they become irregular reflective, kind of high reflective. Again, because of interface changes. Always be thinking of interfaces, pathology. The melanomas tend to be very homogeneous, very dense, which gives this low appearance. But as they become more necrotic, more interfaces are created, you get more reflectivity inside the lesion. So to follow, you want to do two things. You want to look at all the size of the lesion getting smaller, but also internal reflectivity changing and also vascularity these things tend to be quite vascular and they become avascular as they die so that's what you watch for after treatment it's interesting too that when you treat these with radiation plaques if you get a real fast response like within three months they start to shrink down rapidly that's actually a bad thing those tumors tend to be more aggressive they're the ones uh, I guess they're so vascular so uh, aggressive that they when radiation kills them but they just they have a higher chance of recurrence. So you don't want real fast shrinkage, you want kind of a slower, uh, in fact, we used to even get a little bit increase in size after several months they'd come back and they were thicker than they had been before surgery, uh, before radiation, we used to get worried about that, but actually it's probably from necrosis, from edema, and then they get gradually smaller over time. So what you want is to get, when you first see the tumor after about six months, maybe the same size or slightly smaller and then gradually smaller over several years. That's what a good response. Uh, poster extension, uh, here's a large tumor here, melanoma from there to there, and this is the, the a, a B scan at little density in the orbit. That's a posterior nodule. It's broken through the sclera. It's actually in the orbit, so you see that. That changes the, the situation, especially if you want to nucleate these. You've got to be really careful because that, if, if that's not intact, if that's like encapsulated, you probably are okay, but if it's not, you get into the orbit talking exoneration, which is really a horrendous procedure. You ever seen that? They do any exonerations here at all? I mean, since you've been here, have they? Yeah. Pretty rare. Yeah, it's not very common. Yeah, it's way to sell something like that. Pretty mutilating procedure. This is a case that I saw years ago. It's kind of a not great picture, but the, the, there was a lesion here and Looked again a couple years later, it looked about the same. It wasn't all that elevated looking. It wasn't, I could change that much, maybe slightly bigger basal dimensions. But the ultrasound showed actually it was breaking through uh, into the orbit. So the lesion was there, which is not very big, but actually the big part is in the orbit. So it was actually growing posteriorly. And the CT scan verified that. Here's a lesion here with a large orbital component. So Again, it's a reason to look at these with ultrasound, even if they look kind of small, because sometimes they are growing posteriorly, and you wouldn't know that unless you did the ultrasound and looked in the orbit. What kind of lesion was that? That was a spindle A melanoma. So correlation of microanatomy, we talked about this yesterday. You know, dense cells, uh, not a lot of interfaces, a few blood vessels here and there, but uh, they really um, get low reflectivity because of this. The more homogeneous the tissue is, the lower reflectivity, the more regular it is uh, on the A skin, especially. And this shows going through the uh, the eye here. Here's the where the probe is against the sclera. The vitreous here is rather flat because it's homogeneous. And then the tumor, you change the uh, um, the uh, sound uh, velocity. You go from one velocity to another, and you get the uh, in time, inside the uh, tumor. These are kind of key criteria for melanoma diagnosis. And the collaborative ocular melanoma study done probably 10 to 15 years ago uh, used these criteria. Uh, ultrasound was the standard to follow these lesions. 
and they estimate about 99.7% accuracy with uh, ultrasound. So we've gone from 20% uh, uh, misdiagnosis to 0.2% or so misdiagnosis. So it's really changed the game to follow these lesions. So it's really the standard of care. And these are criteria. Most of these are A-scan criteria. So you want to have the internal structure to be regular. The spikes inside don't go up and down a lot. They're kind of the same uh, level of spike. Reflectivity, low to medium, uh, consistency, solid. That means the surface is not moving a lot. Vascularity, fast, spontaneous vascularity, and this is a real-time study, so you can actually see vascularity on both A and B scan. And then the B scan criteria, shape, mushroom, or color button. So I'll go through all these, but these are the criteria that I use. So I like to use both A and B scan to look at these lesions. By doing that, we're really almost approaching pathology. Yes? Uh, what was non-spine? with non-spontaneous. Some of these are not that vascular, especially for some reason, ciliary body tumors don't tend to be real vascular. They can still be melanomas, especially smaller ones, have to be a certain size before it starts showing up. But most tumors are not that vascular. Um, most choroidal hemangiomas aren't. They're just a low flow, venous flow. Um, metastatic tumors really aren't that vascular. So vascularity is really a pretty important criteria. If I see that, it really helps aid the diagnosis. <coughs> So a regular structure, so here's a tumor here, here's the surface, here's the sclera inside the lesion. These spikes, you know, there's a little bit up and down, but they're really pretty much, if you took a line through these, it's not like really an up and down line, it's kind of a you know, slope. So that's fairly consistent regularity. It's not really all over the place as far as the spike height. <coughs> Low to medium reflectivity, so the general, if you take the average of these spikes, compare them to the initial signal over here, you're going to be from this range to about this range, and that range is where you see melanomas. If they're real high, that's against it. If they're super low, like flat, that's against it. So that's kind of where you want to be looking for the reflectivity height. Solid consistency, again, this doesn't play off. To, I'll show you a couple of videos here when I'm through, but um, this is a tumor here. This is a retina over it, but I was trying to demonstrate the fact that this retina is moving as the eye makes microsaccadic movements. This is kind of jiggling, but the tumor is solid. It doesn't move. And that's even more apparent on the A scan. It's just there's a spike, spike is solid. It doesn't jiggle where it does with a membrane. Another case here, this is a melanoma here showing a retina detachment over it, and the retina was moving a lot, and this tumor was solid and not moving. So solid surface is another criteria. And vascularity, I'm going to show you a good slide of this that I just actually got a couple of days ago, a good video. So here's a mushrooming tumor, and this shows little little tiny uh, vessels just kind of like stars in the, in the night, twinkling in the night, uh, as the vascularity is inside the tumor. So both A and B scan can show that. And the A scan, another video I'll show you too, is showing little spikes moving inside the A scan. So vascularity is something I look for when I look at these lesions. So kinetics of motion of membranes and also spontaneous motion. When the eye is not moving, the eye is still, you still see the rapid flicker of the vascularity. So it's an independent uh, of eye motion. Okay, shape, mushroom, collar button. A lot of these have the shape. And as they break through Brooks membrane, the, uh, the neck of the tumor gets constricted as it pops through Brooks membrane. And you see the tumor pop into the vitreous cavity but the remainder of it's inside the choroid. So you see this neck constriction here is a real extreme example here, just popping through. So these are all shapes of, uh, of the mushroom collar button. It can, also, it can also be dome shaped. This is another one here that's not really mushrooming. That's also a melanoma compared to this, which showing mushrooming shape. So shape is important. If you see a mushroomy shape, that's almost always melanoma, though I've seen a couple of metastatic lesions that also look like that as they grow rapidly and broke through Brooks membrane. But generally, that's going to be a melanoma if you see the mushroom. All right, difference of diagnosis. So what else do you think of? So here's the orangish lesion here, which could be melanoma. It could be amelanotic. A certain percent of these are without any pigment. But the A scan is very helpful. You see the going through the vitreous here. Here's your flat vitreous base here because it's homogeneous. Hit the surface of the tumor. Here's the sclera. Here's the orbit over here. But the actual tumor is from there to there, so it's very high reflective, so that's not melanoma. They don't get that high, and it's rather regular, this up and down uh, pattern to it, which goes along with pathology. 
this, uh, the lesion itself is kind of like a honeycomb, these little blood-filled spaces in the hemangioma. As the sound beam goes through this, it hits a septa, goes up, hits a blood uh, lake, goes down, septa up, so it goes up and down, this up and down kind of motion like that. So that's typical for hemangioma, but not melanoma. If I see that, it really isn't a melanoma. Very helpful. The B scan is kind of nondescript. That could be anything. That could be melanoma. That could be metastatic. So you just don't really know from the B scan. The A scan gets down to pathology correlation. That's why it's so valuable from our A scan. You really get that correlation to what the pathologist sees. Another lesion here. You know, that could be a lot of different things. Um, the A scan shows this. Now, if you look in this part of it, that looked like a melanoma. Here's the surface. Here's the sclera. It's rather regular, kind of medium reflective. But yet as you scan the lesion and look in different areas, you'll see spikes going up and down. Right here, here's inside the lesion, another part of the lesion. Very irregular, higher than normal. Uh, would be for melanoma, so this is not melanoma. It's too irregular internally. So this is a metastatic lesion. And again, here's the B scan. You know, it could be a lot of different things. The A scan, again, is quite helpful. You correlate to pathology. The reason they look like this is because the way the tumor invades the choroid. It invades it kind of sporadically. So here's a dense population of cells. Here's more sparse invasion. So it's kind of, it's not, melanomas tend to be very dense. They invade this choroid very densely. They replace the whole thing. Metastatic lesions kind of invade it in fingers. Little fingers poke out and kind of invade it like that. So you get this interface irregularity. So again, think of interfaces, think of the way the pathology works. Uh, that explains the A scale correlate that is irregular. It's high and low areas, different areas of cell pockets, and different areas of uh, choroidal infiltration. And again, the B scan doesn't really help that much. So A scan, again, is very helpful to know what this is. Another lesion here, kind of this hemorrhagic lesion, a dark area that looks kind of scary, like could be melanoma with some hemorrhage around it. And the A scan, actually in this case, isn't all that helpful because this looks like a melanoma. Here's the surface of the lesion. Here's the sclera. And it's kind of regular, it's kind of medium, low reflective. That could be a melanoma. But if I'm not sure, in a case like this, I'll just have the patient come back in about four to six weeks and check him again. If it is hemorrhagic lesion, like a discoform, this will tend to get smaller as that blood reabsorbs, uh, whereas melanomas are going to stay the same or get bigger. If I just repeat it, in this case, we looked at it again after about two months and the lesion had shrunk, shrunk way down. So this is a lesion here. So instead of being that big lesion with low reflectivity, it was higher, more irregular. As the discoform scar, scarred down over Brick's membrane, you get irregularity inside the lesion. So again, by following the lesion over time, we could actually tell what it was. See a lot of these, any rough idea, uh, how many people have nevi, portal nevi, is a rough guess. 10%. 10%? That's always a good number to pick. <laughs> I used to teach about <clears throat> six to eight percent of people have these, but the latest studies out of Shield studies, they looked at this again, all their cases, they've collected thousands over the years. They're guessing more like 20, 25 percent. People actually have some form of nevus in their fundus. So one of you in this room probably has one if we looked at you. So, you know, they're really pretty common. We see a lot of these, and again, most of these are, you know, pretty obvious. I, the question is, should these always be ultrasounded? Um, of course, I say yes because I do it, but um, you know, in practical uh, situation, I'm not sure if it's critical as long as you'll follow them carefully. But the one concern is posterior extension. That's the one thing you're going to miss just by looking at these on the, at the fundus. You might miss a posterior extension. So that's the one reason I would probably suggest at least a baseline ultrasound at least one time. You don't have to do it you know, consistently, but at least to look at it one time and then follow them uh, with the fundus uh, photos and looking at them. The pathology of these, again, here's a little tiny blip in the choroid, not very big. These tend to be under two millimeters, and uh, reflectivity is hard to tell because they're so small, but it's high. It's not low like melanomas because, these, again, these are kind of the pathologies of, of these is. They're not real dense. They tend to kind of invade the choroid kind of sparsely, so you get interface creation. So with interfaces, you're going to get high reflectivity right in the lesion right there. So that is helpful to look for reflectivity. I think I showed a case yesterday of a patient that the lesion looked about the same size on B-scan, but yet internally it's starting to get lower reflective over time, which meant conversion from a nevus to a spindle, a probably melanoma. In fact, Shills coined the term nevoma, N-E-V-O-M-A, 
which they made up, which is sort of a transition from nevus to spindelae. And it can be tough, even the pathologists, you talk to Nick, sometimes they look at these lesions, especially the days of enucleation was more prominent. Uh, it was sometimes hard to tell, is it a nevus, is it spindelae, because that transition between the two can be difficult. So nevoma is probably a reasonable term. And I watch those more carefully. If I see some of those criteria for if reflectivity being lower, more regular, I will suggest we watch it more carefully than otherwise. All right, a famous case out of, uh, out of Utah, actually. This is not the actual case, but it's similar. A woman about 30 had come in. Uh, Henry Van Dyke was the chairman here years ago. And she was seen and uh, had this lesion. And there was a test in those days called the P32 test. It actually inject a radioactive isotope of uh, radioactive phosphorus and be taken up by a rapidly growing lesion, like a melanoma. So if she had a positive P32 test. They gave her the injection, they scanned the eye with the detector and they found out she had a positive p32 test so just looking at this lesion the way it looked and the p32 they took the eye out well this was one of the this was the first path proven case of an osteogenic uh, i mean of a choroidal osteoma so osseous chorostoma so it's actually calcium in the choroid get this real dense uh, bone like looking lesion here's the b scan with shadowing behind it this this the sound is just absorbed by the lesion so behind the in the orb you don't see much Here's a real high spike on the A scan. So, and actually, Gas first published his report of these cases in the same journal that this was published in. So, uh, famous Utah case here. So, in pathology animals. But this is in women tending to the 20 to 40 age group. <clears throat> these often these are these are not malignant, but they can cause a lot of visual problems because they grow in the posterior pole. They can involve the macula, the nerve, result in visual loss. There's really no treatment for them, but they are calcified, and the ultrasound is really very dramatic. I mean, just Instantly, you see the calcium. There's, there's no question what it is. Melanomas don't look like this. Nothing else really does except these lesions. Okay, the bane of pediatric ophthalmologists, they hate leukocoria. When I was at UCLA, they used to just pull their hair out because you know, the, the implications are so profound. If you miss retinoblastoma, you know you're going to have a dead child. If you overreact and take the eye out, then you got a lesion that wasn't malignant and you've taken the eye out. So I know. The pediatric guys here still worry about these all the time and see these cases that they agonize over. So the list of things to think about when you see leukocoria in a child, of course, retinoblastoma is number one. Uh, PHPV, ROP, Coast disease, colobomas, congenital cataract, inflammatory displays. These are all things that can give leukocoria in a child. But ultrasound has a, a real role in these cases, certainly with uh, retinoblastomas. Um, Here's a lesion here, but you see this kind of dispute, uh, diffuse uh, scattered calcium throughout the lesion. And again, what happens is it shadows the orbit. It looks like the sclera is missing here. It really isn't. It's just the lesion is so dense with the calcium that blocks the sound, so you don't see the sclera. It shadows it or masks it. So you can get this false appearance of scleral breakthrough with orbital invasion, which really isn't there. So you just have to understand that. But these calcified lesions here on the A scan give a lot of high spikes because of the calcium foreign body like signal, get real high reflectivity, irregular reflectivity. So most of these lesions are calcified. The literature varies a little bit, but it's probably 85 to 95 percent do have calcium, but a small percent are not calcified. But still, in a child with a mass lesion, you still have to assume it's retinoblastoma until proven otherwise. But the calcium really helps to see that. It can be very fine calcium, it's sometimes it's very diffuse and even CT scans will miss it. So here's one that's calcified on CT scan, it's obvious, but here's one that's really very, very faint calcium, just picked up barely by the ultrasound, which the CT had missed. And I think the current dictum is that CTs are not indicated in children and for retinoblastoma. Anybody know why that is? Radiation, yeah. They, there's a high incidence of secondary tumors in these kids, up to 20%. Certainly the old days of radiation, these actually treating with radiation are pretty well gone because of that danger. And they sometimes get remote uh, secondary cancers too. Oxygenic sarcoma is even away from the eye. So what that is, we're not quite sure. It's a second hit philosophy, but anyway, so ultrasound is now the standard to look at these uh, for calcium. Um, Dr. Harry, yes. do you know what cholesterol crystals like includes? Yeah, little tiny cholesterol crystals drive me crazy because I saw two cases like that a couple months ago, these really diffuse retinoblastoma that had little tiny bright spots. And that can, I always worry about that, you know. I, I thought it probably one actually had calcium, one didn't. 
in those two cases, but that can be hard. You know, the little tiny pinpoint cholesterol crystals can sort of simulate calcium sometimes. So the calcium tends to be kind of just spotty throughout these lesions pathologically, so that explains the uh, ultrasound findings. Ganter segment lesions, here was a case we saw years ago that uh, had this kind of a lesion peripherally, kind of hard to pick up as you aim the ultrasound probe really peripherally, you could kind of pick it up, but by doing an immersion technique, you put a shell between the lids and fill it full of fluid, and then you can see the anterior segment quite well. Here's the iris. Here's this tumor kind of hiding behind the iris back in the celery body area. So in a child, you think of uh, things like dictyoma or medulloepithelioma, which this, in fact, was. There was a high-frequency uh, uh, 50 megahertz B scan showing the lesion here, and here was the eye nucleated. Okay, this is a not uncommon um, artifact. If you look at a patient and put the probe re peripherally, the B-scan probe, and kind of aim it towards the anterior segment, sometimes this will pop up, and that sure looks like a lesion right there, that round looking thing. So you actually had a case sent to me once that was scheduled for, I think, radiation the next day or something, and they asked me to ultrasound it, and it wasn't a tumor, it was a lens. As you get real peripheral, you catch the edge of the lens, and so to verify that, I did, an, I did an immersion scan and showed that the lens was down and had a cataract and there was no tumor besides this, but that's, you can actually do that, so something to be aware of. In fact, here's a case where as the eye moved, this kind of rolled across the fundus, and I'll show that to you in a video clip here in a second. So that is overview of ultrasound of eye tumors. So let me just get this video and show you a couple of these. This is a case that I just got off the uh, flash drives that didn't copy real well, but I think we can see enough to get it. But this is a patient I saw in clinic, uh, referred up here a few days ago. And here is the tumor here, which you can see behind it, see back in behind the sclera, that lucency. So it looks like a tumor, probably melanoma with extraspleral extension. You can see vascularity, see that rapid flicker inside that, little flickering motions inside the tumor and then also behind it, see that lucency behind it. So that's concerning that this might be extraspheral extension. The one thing it also could be besides melanoma though is a typical lymphoid hyperplasia. It's been reported inside the eye. These lymphoid cells can get into the choroid and they can also have this extraspheral uh, kind of a component to it. So it could be that. So we're still kind of watching it, doing a workout to, to do some things. Okay, here's, I think I showed this yesterday, but there's this rapid little flicker inside that. See, it's just kind of a little shimmering motion, that spontaneous vascularity. Right there, you see that little rapid flickering inside that. So if you see that, that's consistent with the blood flow. And that's usually melanoma, not much else does that. rapid flicker inside this lesion. So if I see that, that's very helpful. If I don't see it, it still doesn't rule out melanoma. But it really, most other lesions aren't going to cause that. I think I have an A scan here. Also inside this, you can just see this rapid, really jerking motion. I mean, things are kind of moving here throughout the orbit because there's blood flow there, but right inside the lesion, it really is rapid. It's just kind of spontaneous, independent of eye motion. So both the A and B scan can show vascularity. OK, 
Okay, that's kind of an overview of iTumors. I think we have a little time to show you a little bit about the orbit. Again, with modern imaging techniques being so good, you kind of wonder what you'd need the ultrasound. It really isn't that helpful, especially the B scan, because we can see uh, so well with CTs and MRI scans, but there are indications for it. So I found these things, the B scan, especially helpful for optic nerve drusen, which we see a lot, which MRIs don't pick up, and CTs can, but that's kind of overkill to do a CT scan to see drusen. Sometimes they will miss them and retrobulbar lesions, subtenons lesions, uh, rapid screen for proptosis just in the clinic, enlarged peritomic vein and a supposed uh, fistula, embolic material in the uh, central retinal artery. So these are things that I think the B-scan still has a role in and can augment uh, other imaging techniques. So we talked about drusen. Any rough idea how many people have optic nerve calcified drusen? 10%, right, Lila? <laughs> it's about 1%, but 1% to 2%. depends on clinically versus autopsy studies. They find more in autopsy studies because they, you know, they can find hidden bruising. But uh, probably 1% to 2%. Brad Katz and I did a study several years ago looking for the gene, which we have not found yet, unfortunately. But we used to go out to MRI unions in the summertime and take my ultrasound machine, and he'd draw blood, and we'd check people's eyes out in reunions and got all the cousins and relatives that came for the reunion. Got potato salad along with it too, so it was, was okay. But anyway, so that's kind of the incidence in the population. And these can show up in children, although usually I've not really seen calcification before about eight or nine years old. So I think they can be there, but if they're not calcified, I have a hard time picking them up by ultrasound. So the question is, when do they actually start to calcify? But that's the earliest I've seen, it was about eight or nine years old. And they can run in the families. If, if a family has them in the family tree, like somebody else has it, then there's a higher incidence of drusen in, in, in the whole family. But if it's just one isolated individual, then it's probably 1% or so. Anyway, so these tend to run sometimes. They have a kind of a very funny uh, dominant penetrance, but it's really kind of sporadic. So in the family group, I'll sometimes see a parent with it, sometimes a cousin, sometimes another relative. So that's kind of just sporadic throughout the family. But you can save a lot of money and a lot of grief if you just uh, think of ultrasound for these cases. I still see probably at least a couple times a month, I'll see kids send to me that, you know, seen somebody by their local doctor and they see the swollen nerve and get all nervous and they're sent to the neurologist and get a big workup and go through a lot of stuff and they come back and pick up the drusen, so it's just easy to pick them up. OCT, some claim it's good for drusen, others not. I'm not still convinced yet. I've looked at a number of cases with OCT, and I think sometimes it's hard. You really aren't looking. I mean, it's really obvious on ultrasound. You see the calcium, it just stands out at you, but OCT is, you have to kind of sometimes kind of imagine it. But anyway, I think it's the standard of care for these cases where you're just not sure. And again, the, uh, if you don't find drusen, like in this swollen nerve here, we can do this 30 degree test where we look at the nerve uh, in primary gaze. So here's the nerve from here to here. And if you had the patient abduct the eye 30 degrees, the nerve thins out. So this nerve has gone from here to here, which is called a positive 30 degree test, which is positive for fluid around the nerve, which means it's probably uh, pseudotumorous cerebri, something like that. So all the tumors like gliomas don't tend to do that. They tend to stay thick. So they're thick primary gaze. They stay thick as you look to the side because they're a solid lesion. But a fluid around the nerve is going to thin out as you stretch the nerve by looking to the side. Ritual vulvar lesions, subtenons lesions, ulcerous pruritus, uh, things like that. Lymphoid hyperplasia that get behind the sclera. Subtenon space gets hyperlucent. And that's very helpful. You can pick this up on the ultrasound sound very easily, so that's a, a good test for it. So this is a case of ulcerous scleritis. You can see the scleral thickening here, 
with the sub-T non-lucency behind it with inflammation behind the sclera, the sub-T non-space. Rapid screen for apoptosis, you know, Friday night, five o'clock, you're flogging away and that last patient comes in and they look kind of bulgy. Well, you know, it takes five seconds to put the ultrasound on and see they got a lesion compared to something like pseudoproptosis like myopia or something like that. So you know, it's very helpful, rapid screening test. Enlarged ophthalmic vein, you start thinking, you see these kind of tortured vessels on the conjunctiva. Um, you know, you listen for a brewery, but a lot of times you don't hear a brewery with these low flow fistulas. But if you see this enlarged superophthalmic vein kind of creeping across the orbit, kind of serpiginous going from nasal to temporal, this tubular structure, that's consistent. This is a more dramatic example here showing the enlarged superophthalmic vein right here. So if you see that, that means it's uh, increased blood flow. Color Doppler is very helpful for these, but you can still see this without color Doppler just on the, in the B scan. Embolic material, I talked about this yesterday, the uh, central anartery occlusions, about a third of these will have embolic material um, on B scans. So you can see behind the lamina cribosa, this bright density. So that's worth doing, just to, again, the Friday five o'clock case, just to, if you see that, you know it's embolic. So you have to really pursue the embolic workup, send them right away for the stroke workup. So I think we do now anyway. I think that's pretty much standard of care now. I guess central retinoid occlusion just send them for the stroke workup anyway, but this kind of verifies what you're thinking of. And characterizing pathology. We, I do two views of the orbit. I do a kind of a transocular going through the globe into the orbit. So you go through the eye here, here's the orbit tissue here, and here's a paraocular bypassing the globe right into the orbit. So the orbit tends to be high reflective because it's full of interfaces. It's got septa, fat, blood vessels, muscles. So you get a lot of reflection in the orbit. And again, the vitreous is homogeneous. So it just shows a contrast of reflectivity between homogeneous media versus high reflective uh, media with a lot of membranes. Case of the lacrimal tumor, you can see on the lacrimal gland, here's a thickened lacrimal gland from there to there. And this kind of up and down movement inside the gland goes along with the mixed cell kind of tumor with the way the uh, pathology uh, shows the, uh, the different cystic spaces within the lesion. Quantitation of optic nerves, muscles, this is very valuable. All the, all the time we get, you know, CTs, MRIs, are the muscles big? Well, I think they are, the radiologist looks, I think it looks big. It's, it's subjective though. This is actually a quantitative test. You can actually do the A scan and measure things. So this is a uh, optic nerve here from there to there. This is, again, this is a 30 degree test. This is the nerve thickened here, and this is thinner here. There's some papers out there claiming that B scan can be used to measure nerve thickness, especially in the ER literature. They claim to be able to do that. I really don't think so. It's really hard. These nerve shadows can really, you can fool yourself a lot. Where do you measure? What point do you measure from? I don't think B scan is very helpful to measure nerve thickness, but A scan, you can actually quantitate it. I can actually put a caliper there, electronic like caliper, and measure the thickness of the nerve. And then the uh, muscles, measuring muscles, we scan the muscle. Going here's medial rectus muscle, kind of the, towards the insertion, go the further back towards the orbit, so we can actually go along the muscle and measure the thickest point of it and quantitate that. Sinus disease, this is not, of course, the best test for sinus, CT is much better, but at least to pick it up, you can screen. The patient has a lot of pain uh, around the eye, kind of fullness feeling. All these signals here from the sinus, Normally sinuses are air filled and air blocks ultrasound. That's why you have to use conducting media when you use ultrasound. But if you have fluid in the sinus or other things, tumors, polyps, you get a lot of signals from the sinus. So you pick that up, you see that, that means there's a sinus disease, whatever it is. I don't know, I get a CT scan at that point, but it's just a nice screening test. Differentiation, I talked a bit about this. Showing the different topographic, quantitative, kinetic. But the point is, even though you know nothing about A-scan, you can still see the difference in different tissue structures. So here's a normal orbit here, high reflective, all the different interfaces in the orbit. Uh, this is a cavernous hemangioma. You can see the high and low spikes going up and down, consistent with the cavernous spaces inside the lesion. Uh, this is a mixed cell tumor. We talked about that with lacrimal glands, showing the up and down from the, from the different uh, uh, cystic spaces. This is a, uh, I think this is a uh, lymphoma. Uh, right here, this is a lymphoma pseudotumor right here with real low reflectivity, regularity, and here is a glioma. So it just shows, again, the difference in pathology correlation to the A scan, so it's very helpful. 
and we can do kinetics, we can actually push on things, you can push against lesions and see the lesion here, and as you push a little bit, it gets smaller, so you can do kinetic kinds of things with the orbit to look at lesions for consistency and how, how solid they are. Well, that's kind of an overview of the orbit, so we'll just cut it off there. And any questions? Okay, so ultrasound could be useful, so you know, very helpful. And especially in third world stuff, I do a fair amount of that, and there it really is valuable. You get these clinics out there that don't have access to CTs, MRIs, and we can donate an ultrasound to them. It really helps them, increases their capability for both intraocular and orbital processes, so really it's a useful technique. Okay, thanks.